Κυρίες και κύριοι, καλησπέρα σας. Θα παρακαλούσαμε να καθίσετε στις θέσεις σας. Δεν ξέρω αν... Μπα. Δεν ξέρω αν... Α, ωραία. Βλέπουμε τα μικρόφωνα. Παρακαλώ πολύ να, να πάρουμε τις θέσεις μας για να ξεκινήσουμε. Ο Πρωθυπουργό ήταν στην ώρα του. Ας είμαστε και εμείς συνεπείς. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. You know, mm -hmm. Honorable Prime Minister, dear ministers, distinguished guests, I welcome you on behalf of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce to this 2022 uh, GES roundtable discussion and dinner with guests of honor the Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and uh, the EY Area Managing Partner for Europe, the Middle East, India and Africa, Ms. Julie Lean uh, Tegland, who will be joining us via uh, live feed. This is the third time that we meet Mr. Prime Minister, starting in 2019, and um, most notable was uh, the, the one in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. And as I was telling you when you were coming in, most of the, the, the things that you predicted and, and you promised, you, you did, and they happened. To say that the world has changed since 2019, when you were elected into government, would be a great understatement. For almost four years now, and since our first meeting, we, and I mean the country, have been pushing ahead through successive crises, putting out fires and mitigating disasters. I believe polycrisis, which is a Greek word, is an actual term which is used to uh, explain simultaneous, the simultaneous occurrence of several catastrophic events at the same time. And 2022 has not been any different. On the contrary, it has been marked by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing war, soaring inflation and energy crisis, and tensions 
in Europe and not only in Europe. In these volatile and uncertain conditions, and while several countries much larger than Greece are struggling with uh, the threat of a recession, Greece must once again be tested in its resolve. We have come this far prevailing against stacked odds and now it is the time to hold firm. Challenging times such as these call for big bets, as is the name of the summit. And for Greece that means betting big on ourselves. We must take the necessary steps to bolster our position as a pillar of stability in the Eastern Mediterranean and to protect our economy against the coming storm. We must actively work to preserve our current momentum, redoubling our efforts to enhance on energy, manufacturing and tech sectors, among others which I'm not naming here and which are more traditional, fostering entrepreneurship and, of course, something that you are doing very well, attracting investment. At the same time, we must be vigilant and not linger too far away from our ESG goals and commitments. It is especially during these challenging times that we need to stand our ground and stand up for what we value and believe in as a business community, as a nation, and as a global partner. And it goes without saying, being here at uh, the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce, that I should underline that Greece and the United States enjoy an enduring partnership and relationship which is based on mutual respect, shared values, the principles of international law, and in recent years, this relationship has grown stronger, very much with your help, Mr. Prime Minister. And our cooperation is more multifaceted now than it has ever been. I believe that at this critical junction for our, our country, the relationship with the United States can help propel it towards a better development in the future. And with this small intro, let's start our discussion of tonight. So, Prime Minister, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I, before uh, asking you a few questions, I'd like just to say a few words on housekeeping. I will ask you uh, two questions and then I will address um, Ms. Talbert. Uh, and uh, so the, the situation will continue. I, I think we have some time and we'll try and get as many of these questions that we have prepared. And I think they're interesting questions. So I would like to start by asking you the following question. During your governance, you have met with various prominent business people of global stature. What are your best arguments for convincing them to invest in our countries? And what were their main concerns? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back. It's great to have this meeting again without the pandemic uh, constraints. However, as you pointed out, we are facing all sorts of different uh, uh, challenges that uh, need to be uh, addressed. So certainly never a dull moment in these three and a half years that we have been uh, in power. I can tell you that the argument to attract uh, foreign direct investment to Greece now uh, is easier than it was three years ago. Uh, when we first came into power, there was a lot of positive momentum uh, we came with a well thought out and well designed reform program. Uh, we were saying the right words to the international community, but uh, we still had to prove that we could actually get things done uh, and change uh, the business climate, make sure that we put our uh, public finances uh, in, in order, uh, and ensure that what people saw as a country which could actually exceed expectations in terms of its performance could actually materialize. Now, uh, three years later, it's easier to make that case because we can point to some hard facts, uh, growth that has been much higher than the Eurozone uh, average uh, growth, a country that has attracted uh, record foreign direct investment. Uh, companies, American companies that I don't think would have ever considered investing in Greece are actually investing substantial amount of capital uh, in the country. 
and there is a pipeline uh, of uh, uh, interest uh, which makes us very optimistic that uh, 2021 and 2022 are not going to be uh, one one-off years but that this trend uh, will actually uh, continue and we've also demonstrated that uh, we have a long-term reform plan for the country which we can implement in spite of uh, all the crises that we had to deal with. I would also argue that some of the crises that we had to deal with were also uh, opportunities to strengthen uh, Greece's uh, position, not just as a pillar of stability, but I would say as a center of uh, innovation and uh, innovative public policy uh, in areas where we were always perceived as laggards, such as uh, the digital uh, transformation. So when I speak to uh, investors now, be it capital, investors in capital, in the capital markets, or uh, investors that actually want to uh, uh, really in invest uh, uh, in the country through foreign direct investment, I can tell you that our case uh, is easier. Of course, we do face significant headwinds, uh, but I'm absolutely convinced that uh, we will do much better in 2023 than uh, Europe will do. Uh, our natural comparative advantages as an economy that is more focused on services and less focused on manufacturing, although we have a very decent manufacturing base, um, makes us more immune to some of the challenges that the more uh, manufacture-dependent economies of Europe uh, are currently facing. Uh, and of course, uh, the reforms don't stop. Uh, we're just getting started. And hopefully, if the Greek people place their trust in us for uh, a second uh, term, uh, we have a very clear plan of what we want to achieve um, you know, post uh, the summer of, um, uh, of 2023. Uh, and much more uh, and a much better know-how now, being more experienced, having learned from our mistakes, on how we will um, get about uh, doing that. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. The title of this year's Greek Economic Forum was uh, Big Bets in Challenging Times. I mentioned that during my intro. How do you expect the world to be shaped in 10 years from now? And what should be the biggest bets of, uh, let's say, or perhaps renaming it, priorities of Greek governments? Well, the, the in 10 board. years from now, you'll be celebrating your 100th uh, sort of uh, anniversary uh, since the creation of uh, 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 the American uh, Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. So uh, my predictive abilities don't extend that far. But what I can, what I can tell you uh, is that the big bets that uh, we are currently uh, placing are essentially non-negotiable when it comes to the green transition, the digital transition, the skills transition. What does it mean to actually educate our labor force uh, our, our youngsters, but also uh, uh, the, you know, the labor force that uh, is, is currently uh, in need of uh, significant reskilling uh, and, uh, and upskilling. You know, the bets that we, that, that we place in terms of shielding and protecting our, uh, our country, in terms of strengthening our defense uh, posture uh, in the eastern uh, Mediterranean, uh, all these are you know, long-term bets, especially when it comes to, to energy. We want to be a global protagonist in the green transition and in the production of uh, energy, in particular electricity, uh, from uh, renewables. We are already one of the top 10 countries. We know we need to move uh, faster uh, in that direction and we know how we can actually uh, get there. At the same time, uh, we know that hydrocarbons will play uh, an important role uh, in the interim period until a time when they no longer will be necessary. This is also a bet we are placing on Greece becoming a regional center for LNG at a time when Europe is desperately looking for alternative sources of gas to diversify away from its um, uh, Russian dependence. I mean, the digital uh, bet, uh, we've been, I think, more successful than many people expected in, in terms of transforming the state and simplifying the relationship between um, citizens, businesses, uh, and the Greek uh, state, but we're just at, at the beginning, uh, understanding how this digital uh, transformation, especially the use of big data, will uh, 
will change the way um, we as a state interact. That's probably you know, the next uh, uh, challenge. And of course, uh, uh, how do we position uh, ourselves to leverage uh, our human talent? This is also incredibly critical, you know, from our universities opening up uh, to the world to teaching you know, English uh, to four-year-olds that have started um, uh, kindergarten. I think one of the most uh, sort of optimistic events I have attended over the past you know, uh, uh, month was this uh, visit of you know, 30 American universities uh, to Greece and the tremendous interest I saw in terms of forging educational partnerships between Greek public universities and I'm not just talking about the public universities of Athens and Thessaloniki, but also our regional universities uh, and leading American academic institutions. Incredible vibe, incredible sort of uh, goodwill in terms of transforming Greece uh, as, uh, as a um, uh, regional uh, education uh, center. So I think that uh, you know, the bets that we, uh, th that we place are, are well thought out, they're in line with sort of the, the mega trends that we need to think about when we try to envision uh, the world in 2030 or the world in 2040. We have actually set up a foresight unit um, reporting to the office of the Prime Minister. By foresight we mean uh, uh, sort of a public policy unit that is exactly looking at these long-term trends beyond what will happen, you know, this year. Uh, or, uh, or, or next year, and uh, this is also in line with what uh, the European Union is trying uh, to do. Uh, so we are perfectly aware that we need to place some bets now, the benefits of, of which we will see you know, beyond our terms, uh, but you know, that's the way you know, countries have to progress if we're just looking at you know, the short term, just of the next electoral cycle. I mean, these, these long-term investments would never take place. Sound like good bets to me. So allow me, uh, Prime Minister, to turn to Ms. Uh, Julie Lee Teiglen, which I'd like to welcome uh, to tonight's round table. You're, wel you're welcome. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Very short introduction. Born in the US, you live in Germany, and you are responsible for um, 115,000 people and companies would generate turnover of 14.1 billion dollars. So that's, that's quite a number. Um, my first question to you is, what are your views about the current crisis and to what extent do you think it will continue to impact economies and businesses all over the world? We get the international perspective now. Fantastic, and it's such, such an honor to be with you. I really believe that the recession that we're facing right now will hopefully be a little bit like a puddle. It's going to be slow and shallow and short, but I know that the recovery will probably take a little longer than we expect for that puddle to dry up. It's going to equally be slow and gradual. And frankly, it's going to be based on the level of consumer spending. I do expect a stronger economic recovery as we look towards the second half of 2023. I think it's important that we mention that there are four real economic drivers for this. Number one, we have to be honest that the central banks across the globe, those rate hikes, they're going to impact economic growth throughout the next year. Those rate hikes are slow, and the monetary transmission takes a while to work through the system. Equally, we're going to see developments in the energy market. It's going to continue to weigh down on our economic outlook. And in fact, while we have really well-managed energy trends this winter, thanks to really large gas storage levels, which are nearly at 100% of capacity, we know that as we look forward to next year, with almost no Russian pipeline flows into Europe, replenishing that gas in the coming period is going to be more difficult. We also expect that Asia is going to really take off, and as a result, there'll be more pressure on gas prices. I thirdly mentioned something that is not necessarily economic, but clearly geopolitical. 
Let's be honest that geopolitics has an impact on our economic recovery. And in fact, the war on Ukraine plays a large role in how the normalization of prices and energy and food commodities actually works out across the globe. If that war ends faster than we all expect, that rebound will come stronger and faster as well. And last, let's not forget that our economies are largely driven to some extent by consumer spending. As long as labor markets are resilient, we don't see unemployment increasing substantially, and that's going to support some consumer spending that's going to allow us to grow modestly up until and into the second half of 2023. So I conclude by kind of saying a little bit of a puddle. It might feel like a big splash, but we're hoping that the recovery will occur quickly. It might take a little longer and be a little slower than we hope, but it won't be as bad as we all feel when we get wet. Thank you. Thank you. Let me return to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I'm, I'm going to ask you to bring out the glass ball again and talk about the future. How different do you think our world will be in the future after the end of the war in uh, Ukraine? What do you think will be the main characteristics that will be governing European policies and Europe's relation to the USA, uh, Russia and China? Is it more than ever possible that this crisis will contribute to a shift towards more introverted policies in the European states? We have to, first of all, you need to be aware we're dealing with a situation which was completely unthinkable you know, a year or maybe 18 months ago, you know, a war in the European heartland, which has completely disrupted energy flows from Russia to Europe, has highlighted our excessive dependence on Russian gas, but has still demonstrated that in the short term we have proven to be you know, rather resilient, of course, the real question, as was pointed out in the previous intervention, is how are we going to fill our storage next year when we won't have access to, um, uh, to Russian gas. Uh, but still, this is you know, a major, major disruption. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, the United States um, making a big bet on uh, uh, green technology, uh, and uh, but doing it in a way that from a European standpoint, is rather protectionist, which means that you give big incentives for companies that are actually producing uh, in the US and lots of subsidies for clean tech. Uh, Europe is squeezed, might be squeezed, uh, on two fronts. The first is the cost of energy. It is much cheaper to obtain energy, especially gas, in the US. And the second is that, frankly, it is very difficult to convince large European companies now to produce in Europe when they can produce much cheaper in the US. For me, this absolutely highlights the need for a targeted European response to the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, of a similar magnitude. This is something we're beginning to discuss. It needs to happen quickly. We need to send a signal to European companies that they can actually stay and that they should stay and keep producing uh, in Europe. Uh, otherwise, we'll be facing major, major challenges. At the same time, it's important for the U.S. to understand that what it does vis-a-vis -vis China should not affect its transatlantic uh, partner, because we are partners and we will continue to be partners. And, and I think this is something that uh, was also communicated by President Macron uh, to President uh, Biden. And I think in, in that respect, this, you know, uh, uh, this is a view of, I think, all uh, European uh, countries, uh, and that's why I wouldn't be surprised if there are some exceptions to the to the IRA that uh, will also include uh, uh, Europe uh, in the category of those countries that could be exempt uh, for some of the uh, restrictions uh, of the IRA in the same way that Canada and Mexico, which are already part of NAFTA, uh, currently are. So I think we are moving. Uh, towards a world where, um, uh, you know, the globalization as, uh, as we knew it, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, simply looking for the cheapest source of production, it's still going to be there, but it's going to be much weaker, where geopolitics are going to play a bigger role. 
uh, and where um, strategic autonomy is going to become more important. Uh, and this is relevant on, on numerous fronts. This could actually present countries such as Greece with significant opportunities. When we're talking about reshoring and bringing back production to Europe, um, this is uh, an opportunity for a country which has a manufacturing base, is, uh, has access to good logistics, uh, and uh, is, is part of the European uh, community in terms of being you know, a stable country in uh, our part uh, of the world. Let me just give you one example, pharmaceuticals. We were talking a lot during the pandemic and we suddenly realized our dependence uh, on China, not just for masks, but also for drugs or for the raw materials of drugs. Well, I can tell you some Greek companies and some foreign companies have realized that this is an opportunity. And I was, uh, you know, 10 days ago, I was in Tripoli. Uh, and in Tripoli, we have two big investments taking place uh, in the production of, of, of drugs, but also raw materials that can cover not just Greek, but European uh, needs. So this is, and it happened because we gave smart incentives to um, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, to use the clawback as an investment uh, uh, sort of tool to encourage them to invest uh, uh, in Greece. So you can, you can actually uh, see that this reshoring and, and greater control uh, of supply chains may you know, create some challenges. We may not actually be looking for the cheapest source of production, no matter where it is, but it also creates uh, opportunities uh, for European countries, uh, such as Greece, uh, to move into uh, sort of areas uh, of, of investment uh, which uh, we didn't consider to be priorities a few years ago. Excellent. And bearing in mind my background, when I hear you talk about production, I get very excited. But unfortunately, the time is of the essence, so I will move forward with one more question, which is related to the US. We have so many questions here. I would love to ask you, but our ties with the US are stronger than ever. And perhaps now that the image and narrative about uh, Greece, as you pointed out, earlier has changed radically. It is an excellent opportunity to, to change the model of our relationship with expatriates by going beyond the logic of remembering them whenever we need them, but including them as a structural pillar of our development model. How can we achieve it? Well, first of all, let me agree with what you pointed out, that the relationship between Greece and the U.S. is at an all-time high, not just geopolitically, but also economically, uh, culturally. And, of course, you know, the bridge, the natural bridge in that relationship is our you know, Greek diaspora uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and I'm happy because there's much more interest uh, by the diaspora, uh, not just in investing in Greece, but in general in supporting uh, Greek affairs, uh, and I think this is also a, a testimony to the fact that we're able to deliver on our uh, commitments. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, you know, we've uh, also given uh, the, you know, the possibility for uh, um, uh, Greeks who live abroad to, to vote where they actually live, but because of constitutional constraints, we could not get to the 200 votes. Otherwise, we've placed so many constraints. Uh, uh, on, uh, on, on their sort of uh, ability to vote where they live, that the number of people who have actually signed up is, is, is very, very small. Maybe you know, in our next term, this is something that we can actually uh, solve. But if you just look at how many Greeks or Greek Americans are active or in senior positions uh, in the US uh, in fields such as, for example, pharmaceuticals or technology in general, venture capital, uh, or for example, the film industry, uh, you understand why uh, it is uh, not a difficult pitch when we talk to the Greek American community and tell them that Greece has actually changed. And you know, take a look at Greece, and this time you won't be disappointed because we always have to manage uh, expectations. And I know, you know, how uh, how appealing this first trip to Greece was in the past. You have a lovely sort of. Uh, you know, dinner with a view of the Acropolis, you think this is a fantastic country, and then you start dealing with a bureaucracy and things usually fall apart. I think we've been able to, to break that, uh, uh, that trend uh, and, uh, and deliver. And of course, diasporas are very, very 
important elements uh, in this globalized world. And there are also sources of talent. We talk a lot about uh, the ability to support our growth. When we look at our demographics, for example, they're not good. Not just Greece's demographics, but you know, the Western world in, in, in general. So how are we going to drive growth and productivity with poor demographics? Well, one source of, of, of potential demographics is the, you know, the brain drain generation that is already beginning to, to return to Greece. And there are a lot of young, talented, very well-trained Greeks who would be interested, theoretically, to return to Greece, provided there are good jobs and uh, a belief in the, you know, in, the, in the future of the country. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I think the words reliability and trust are very important in this struggle to convince people that Greece has turned the page. And I think your government has been very successful in that. Ms. Teigland, may, may I ask you something about Greece now? Based on your global experience and the megatrends currently impacting the future uh, of future economies, which sectors do you believe Greece should develop more and invest in going forward? That's a great question. And when I look globally and specifically across Europe, if I looked at our own EY Europe Attractedness Survey, we see that there are three sectors that are poised for growth. The digital economy, 45% of our surveys said they are in the lead. Clean tech with renewables, 35%. And health sciences and wellness, these are the three that are really going to drive growth all across Europe. And frankly, this is very much in line with our megatrends around decarbonization, the changing face of technology powered by 5G, quantum computing and edge computing. And of course, the potential to transform the way we treat illness, make things and feed ourselves. When I look at Greece for our EY attractiveness survey, We've seen a real shift towards investments with high added value and where you have an emphasis on a true competitive advantage. This would include agri-food, transport and logistics, and software and IT. These are all very important sectors as we tackle food security, as we see shifts in globalization to nearshoring, and as companies seek to build more resilient supply chain and digitalization accelerates. These were the three. If I was going to place a bet, that's where I would go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, given that there are promising sectors in, in, in Greece, what policies are being put in place to increase their competitiveness in the global market? Well, we have obviously horizontal policies when it comes to promoting Greece as a business destination and we're always very happy when we see Greece really moving up uh, the rankings in terms of uh, you know, the improvement we've made in the business environment. Uh, it's, uh, these surveys are important uh, because a lot of investors uh, uh, look at them. Uh, so when you talk about you know, stable um, uh, tax regime, uh, uh, labor reform, on top of that, you know, political stability as a, as, as a country where, you know, things happen in a predictable manner. But then, of course, uh, you come to sort of more vertical policies when it comes to specific uh, sectors, some of which you have uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, and then, of course, we have, you know, all, all sorts of policies that uh, target areas where we feel we have natural uh, uh, comparative advantages. Let me just highlight two. They're, in a sense, interconnected. You mentioned agri-food. Tremendous opportunities in Greece uh, as, as a producer of quality uh, agri-food products and tremendous opportunities um, uh, for productivity gains, uh, also using uh, technology. It's beginning to happen, uh, but we can move so much faster. Uh, in that uh, direction, which means that we move away from the model of the individual farmer uh, into sort of collective organizations that are run as proper businesses. Uh, but uh, what we can produce uh, uh, is remarkable in terms of quality, and there will be a market, uh, a market, uh, of course, not just in Greece, but a market, uh, you know, primarily outside Greece. And that's why our exports have been booming. I need to point out that exports in Greece of goods and services have surpassed 40% of our GDP. Ten years ago, we were at 20%. It's a huge leap. 
it's an indication that the economy is really becoming much more uh, extrovert. Uh, and uh, uh, we can still capture you know, many, uh, m many markets with high quality products. Look at our olive oil. I mean, 10 years ago, there was very little branding. I mean, look at now all the initiatives, you know, smaller producers really branding uh, their, their olive oil, making sure they take care of their product. Uh, and uh, you know, exporting it at, at very high premiums. Of course, the second sector is tourism. I would say tourism and wellness. You mentioned wellness. Wellness is a broad term, uh, but uh, I think one of the mega trends, uh, uh, which has to do with the way people spend their money, uh, works in our favors because I think at the end of the day, given the choice between spending on a good or on an experience, people will increasingly choose the second. Between your new phone and your holiday, people will pick a holiday. And Greece, we, I have a very clear vision. I want to make Greece the top destination, the top tourist destination in the world, full stop. I mean, I will not settle for, um, uh, for anything less in terms of the uh, experience, you know, the service, catering, uh, of course, to people who can spend more. And that means no compromises when it comes to sustainability when it comes to locally you know, sourced products, when it comes to the connection um, to, um, to our cultural heritage. And of course, wellness also means that people can actually not just come and you know, spend holidays here. They can work from Greece, they can retire in Greece, they can study in Greece. Uh, so the destination and what we say quality of life, you know, work-life balance or whatever, or, you know, what does it mean to spend time in, in a beautiful place, not just to go to the beach in the summer. That will become very, very uh, important. And I think Greece is uniquely positioned uh, to take advantage of this sort of total experience, which is uh, connected not just to, you know, sometimes we think of wellness just in terms of a, of a spa or something. It's something much, 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 much bigger uh, than that. Uh, and uh, uh, it has to do with, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the weather, the food, the social networks, uh, the ability to get really still incredibly original experiences in Greece, that's what people are craving for. Uh, and I think we're extremely well positioned and we need to take some tough choices also to make sure that we protect our destinations. Um, and uh, because some of them are already reaching, you know, breaking point in terms of uh, uh, their impact uh, on infrastructure. Uh, so uh, a model that will place, uh, you know, high-end sustainability at the very core uh, of how we view the experience of someone visiting Greece, I think is still offering us, you know, lots of opportunities. And, uh, and uh, this means that also, you know, valuations will increase. Uh, uh, there's more money to be made out of, uh, out of tourism. People will get better wages as they become more skilled, uh, as they offer uh, uh, new services. Who, who would have thought now, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, becoming an executive chef was not a very, you know, promising, uh, you know, career path. Why don't you ask, you know, people in tourism how much they pay now for a, an executive chef and, you know, how, how, what a fantastic, you know, uh, job this is that actually you're actually making good money. I, I think that we, are, we all share an understanding when your team says that the best salesman of, of Greece is the prime minister. I can only sell. Uh, I can only sell a good product. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Which you also helped form, and I think we all help. Thank you for that. Um, I think with, with within the time limits that we have, we have um, promised um, Ms. Uh, uh, Tigland that she could ask you a question. So if that's with okay great, by with, you, with great pleasure. Okay. Mm. So Ms. Tigland, it's over to you now. Thank you so much. I, I've been so impressed by Greece's performance, not just in terms of attracting additional foreign investment, not just in the transformation that they've been undergoing, but when I look at our EY's Renewable Energy Country Attractiveness Index, given your economy's size, Greece is punching way above its weight. They rank number 16th in the ranking, but already number second, number two in the adjusted index, that's huge and a major accomplishment. But with the spike in energy prices and the impact and focus on renewable and sustainable energy sources, can I ask you, how do you think we could sustain the focus 
and the green transition with all of the short-term pressures on energy supply. And I, I know that this is a big focus of your policy and what you are looking at in Greece. What advice would you give the rest of us and what are you planning to do in Greece? Well, we, we've placed a, you know, a big bet on renewable uh, energy for good reason. We have you know, ample supply of wind and uh, ample you know, um, access to, uh, to sun. And Greece, as you pointed out, is already a protagonist uh, in terms of renewable energy, uh, we have more than 10 gigawatts of installed wind, of installed wind and solar power, and close to another three, two and a half gigawatts of uh, of hydro. Uh, and of course, we're looking to get to 25 gigawatts uh, by uh, 2030. We want to be a net exporter of energy, uh, and uh, we we can do that provided we all also invest in our uh, in our grids because we still have deficiencies both within Greece. There are investments that simply cannot go forward because we don't have the necessary, uh, you know, grid infrastructure. But also, in terms of interconnecting the north of Europe with the south of Europe, it's very interesting. You know, I was talking to my energy expert. If you look at the patterns of of wind and solar, they're incredibly complementary. The truth is, you have more wind in northern uh, Europe in the winter, and you have more sun in southern Europe in the summer. Uh, so if you had truly interconnected grids and you could move energy from the north to the south and vice versa, uh, this an, uh, electricity market uh, would, uh, uh, would function much better than it uh, uh, currently does. Uh, so uh, we, we know what are the barriers we need to overcome. We will have a European regulation on permitting, which I think is very important, uh, which will give us also more firepower to accelerate the permitting, but I would argue that in Greece, the real big bottleneck is a grid. We will use additional resources from the Repower EU facility to invest uh, in, our, uh, in our grids. We need to move faster uh, in that direction, but of course, we also need to be at the forefront of the new technologies, the new clean tech technologies, be it storage, uh, pump storage or battery storage is going to become more and more important, you know, and, you know, projects that include a storage component need to be um, uh, prioritized. You know, capture, carbon capture and storage is going to become um, uh, important because we're not going to be able to get rid of uh, fossil fuels uh, in, uh, in the foreseeable uh, future. And, of course, we need to balance that out with short-term support for households and businesses because there's real pain now, and we've been able to do that. We've captured excess profits from uh, energy producers. We're the first to do it in Europe. We uh, implemented an almost sort of neo-communist 90% tax on the super profits, but we use this money to actually um, support businesses and households. Uh, there is a European uh, uh, regulation that will need to be implemented in Greece as well regarding uh, super profits uh, of, uh, uh, of refineries, which will give us more uh, um, uh, fiscal uh, space in, uh, uh, in 2023. Uh, so in, in, in the short term, we need to make sure we have security supply and reasonable prices. That's why it's so important to get, finally get an agreement. Uh, hopefully we'll have it you know, tomorrow on what we call the price cap uh, of, of imported gas into the European Union but at the same time make the case to accelerate the green transition, not just for economic reasons, but also for geopolitical reasons. Um, uh, because clean energy is not just good for the environment, it's cheap, uh, and no one can take it away from you. Uh, you can be blackmailed um, when it comes to your access to, to wind and sun. And finally, we also have a role to play as a conduit of even possibly even cheaper energy from Africa into Europe. Uh, you know, Northern Africa, if you look at, you know, Egypt, as 5% of Egypt is, uh, is currently occupied, the rest of 95 is desert, so it's not very difficult to find space in Egypt um, uh, to, to put especially um, uh, new photovoltaic uh, um, uh, installations. And that's why we're also talking about, you know, a big cable that will connect Egypt to Greece and to the European grid, of course, with... Uh, 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 the adjacent uh, production capacity to be able to produce the electricity that can then be exported. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I think the message was heard loud and clear, particularly by the 
the president and CEO of the Electricity Distribution Network who are sitting over there. I noticed he's, I noticed he's your main sponsor, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, Prime Minister, I promised you that we will be on time. I think I've kept my word. Well, I wish Mr. I could say, but I have another commitment, unfortunately. But thank you very much for offering me the opportunity to being, participate in this discussion. Thank you for being with us. Ms. Teigland, thank you for, for, uh, for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the roundtable and also the 33rd Greek Economic Summit organized by the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for listening to us.